Within a week after Stephen's disappearance, Stephen's landlord's wife, Tina Bishop, began making online posts on a website called Slick Deals. A few weeks later, she started posting on Web Sleuths forums as well. Today, I just want to go over some of these posts that Tina made. One thing to mention beforehand is that whenever you see a post made by Tina where she mentions Brett Bishop, she uses the initials DH. I was confused about what the initials stood for. I believe they stand for like dearest husband, dearest hubby, something along those lines. In Tina Bishop's post on Slick Deals, she goes by the name of Nikayla. So just for clarification purposes and to make things simpler for all of us, I'm going to remove the initials and the account names and I'm just gonna call people by their actual names. Something I want you all to keep in mind as we go through these posts is that four months before Tina Bishop began making these posts online, her dearest husband, Brett Bishop, had been arrested for being in possession of a stolen Porsche valued at around $100,000, possession of marijuana, possession of multiple stolen prescription pills, and possession of a threaded 22 handgun with a silencer. On December 19th, 2009, Six days after Stephen's disappearance, Tina posts on Slick Deals, stating that they had drove down from Orem, Utah, and stayed the night in the master bedroom at the rental in St. George on the Sunday night that Stephen went missing. She states that her and Brett kept the master bedroom locked up for their own personal use. She states that when they arrived, she looked in Stephen's room and noticed that his room had been tidied up with lots of stuff still there. On December 24, 2009, Tina Bishop states that the Kocher family suspects foul play and that someone had used Stephen's phone to call an AT&T voicemail retrieval to get messages. Probably not his messages, because usually it shows that you called your own phone number if you are getting your own message. But it shows the call was entered as a generic voicemail retrieval number. That was on Monday, December 14, 2009. Now, this information is fascinating to me. If you've seen my first video, you'll recall that I pointed out how the St. George Police Department blacked out the phone number that was dialed on the last phone call made from Stephen's phone number. And it showed that this last call only lasted 10 seconds and was not a call to Stephen's personal voicemail. Here we see Tina stating that this last call was a call to an AT&T voicemail service, not Stephen's voicemail. Why the St. George Police Department black out this phone number is still a mystery to me. In another post on Slick Deals, Tina states that the last time the neighbors saw Stephen was around 10.30 p.m. on December 11, 2009. It was actually December 12, 2009, so this is probably just a mistype. She goes on to say that John across the street said he saw Steve and his car there for about 20 to 30 minutes. This lines up with what I learned from the neighbor John Stringham when I interviewed him a month ago. Now take note here, Tina does not mention that Stephen and John had a conversation about Stephen going to Las Vegas that night. And I think this is important to note because remember that Brett Bishop tells Deanne Kocher early on in Stephen's disappearance that John and Stephen had had this conversation about Las Vegas. After a few informative posts on slick deals, Tina quickly starts talking about Stephen's roommate, Jordan Zirkel. You'll see this theme frequently throughout her posts that most of the time Tina is posting, she's laying blame on someone else, specifically Jordan Zirkel. She even goes as far as posting his prior criminal charges online at one point. Here in this first post about Jordan, she states, his roommate was not so good a person and has since moved and vanished himself. He could have arranged for Stephen to meet someone or some acquaintance that no one knew Stephen had known. She continues saying that Stephen was set up. If someone had intended him harm, then they would have made sure he did not use his personal email or phone that could eventually be traced. She goes on to say that the roommate is not missing as in a missing person. He just moved away rather quickly and was not very cooperative with police investigation, but not enough to appear suspicious, I guess. Apparently he has moved several times and is out of state as well. Well, we know this is not true about Jordan not being cooperative with the police based on the St. George Police Department information that was recently released. The St. George Police Department stated that Jordan had been open with them and was very forthcoming about what he knew about Stephen. Tina concludes this post by adding some important information. She states that there's no internet service at the house, so they both had to go elsewhere to use the internet. This might explain why there were little to no searches on Stephen's personal laptop and why Stephen was frequently visiting the Washington County Library to use the internet there. On January 15, 2010, 
Tina Bishop states that Stephen had spoken with Brett Bishop a few days before he went missing and was planning to have his rent caught up in January. We know 100% that Stephen never called Brett, nor did Brett call Stephen a few days before Stephen went missing. And the reason we know this for certain is because we have all the call logs for Stephen's phone at that point. So how did this conversation between Stephen and Brett take place, you might ask? Well, let's take a look at where Stephen was actually at in the days before he went missing. On December 10th, 2009, we have a receipt from Stephen at a location off the I-15 exit 261. The receipt was for $32.88 and was from the Flying J Travel Plaza. Brett and Tina Bishop were living in Orem, Utah at the time of Stephen's disappearance. So if Tina is saying here in this post that Stephen and Brett had talked a few days prior to Stephen going missing, and we know 100% that they didn't talk over the phone, and now we see a receipt showing that Stephen was in the area where Brett Bishop was living, then it's highly probable that this conversation between Stephen and Brett took place face to face. Tina says that this conversation was about Stephen making plans to have his rent caught up by January. So what exactly was this plan? And why was this plan so important that Stephen had to drive all the way up to meet with Brett in person? rather than just converse over the phone. In an April 2011 Slick Deals post, Tina Bishop mentions the disappeared episode, stating that the Discovery Network did call us and they want to interview us the weekend they were filming the exterior of our house. But we live about four hours from there now, so it wasn't in our plans or budget to travel that weekend. Plus, neither of us want to be on TV. In a May 2011 Slick Deals post, she answers a question about the delinquent rent, stating, I don't think there was a specific payment plan set to catch up rent, just for him to pay as much as he could as soon as he could. He stopped answering Brett's calls so we went down to see if he moved out but all of his things were there. The roommate however had bailed and that room was locked but empty. Something to mention here is that the bishops went down to St. George reportedly the Sunday night Stephen went missing. Brett at this point had called or texted Stephen once at 4.36 p.m. on the day Stephen went missing, according to the unofficial phone ping records. So what Tina is saying here is that they were so concerned that Stephen had moved out because he didn't answer one single phone call. So they drove four hours to St. George. Could this concern actually have been for a more serious reason? Okay, so let's put ourselves in the Bishop's shoes. On December 10th, 2009, Brett Bishop has a conversation with Stephen. And in that conversation, the two of them work out a plan for Stephen to catch up on his delinquent rent. So if you have this plan worked out for Stephen to catch up on his rent, why are you calling him two days later? And what's even more strange is that when you do call him two days later, for whatever reason, and he doesn't answer that one single phone call. And remember, we have the phone call logs that show one call was made to Stephen from, from Brett Bishop. It could have been a text as well. It was a call or text. But it came in at 4.36 p.m. So because Stephen doesn't answer this one single phone call, you freak out. And you think now that Stephen is going to bail on you. Tina goes on to say that she never called Stephen herself directly and that she's not aware of how often Brett would call Stephen. She says that Brett maybe called him around a few times a month, sometimes a lot more than that. She said that they would normally talk about roommates moving in or out and appliance problems. If we look at Stephen's phone call log, we see in the last week before Stephen disappeared, Brett sent Stephen two text messages on December 7th and one text message on December 8th. And then in the unofficial phone ping records, we see that Brett had called or texted Stephen in the afternoon on December 13th, the day Stephen went missing. And then he called or texted Stephen again on the morning of December 14th. So Brett had contacted or attempted to contact Stephen five times via phone in the last week before Stephen was officially listed as a missing person. And that's on top of this conversation that Brett and Stephen had had about catching up on his delinquent rent. So that is a total of six interactions between Brett and Stephen in the last week before Stephen was officially listed as missing. And also throw in the fact that a week before Stephen went missing, Brett had called Stephen's dad and had told his dad that Stephen was behind three months in rent. So there's quite a bit of interaction going on here between Stephen and Brett. In a September 2011 Slick Deals post, Tina Bishop mentions a suspicious house on evening lights. She says, there was a suspicious house, but the occupants have since moved. We know now that this house she's referring to is 2260 evening lights. And we know this because based on the tax records that you can pull up on all of the houses there on evening lights street where Stephen was at when he disappeared. If you look at the tax records for the homes, you'll, you'll see that the 2260 evening lights was the only house that was being foreclosed on and was vacant at or around the time of Stephen's disappearance. So it's 
some point in January of 2010, Tina Bishop shifted over from her post on Slick Deals and she began posting on Web Sleuth forums using the name Still Looking. Just like on the Slick Deals website, she continues to refer to Brett Bishop as DH. In one of her first posts on Web Sleuths, Tina states that her and Brett were falling behind in their own bills and that Brett decided to give Stephen's parents a call. Now remember, when Brett Bishop was questioned by the St. George police, he told them he was not rushing Stephen for the rent and knew he was good for the money and would have it paid up by January. Why then would you call Stephen's dad, Brett? So here we see Tina stating that they were having financial difficulties themselves and that because of these financial difficulties, they were rushing Stephen to pay up his delinquent rent. Around the same time that Tina makes this first post, she also posts that the neighbor saw Stephen come home and leave a short amount of time later at 10.30 p.m. She goes on to say that Stephen might have slept in his car, at a hostel, or with a friend. She continues saying that when Brett is on business trips, he will plan to sleep in his car a few nights to save on the hotel expense. It's kind of odd that she would add this information about Brett going on these long business trips that last for days and how he would sleep in his car. Because in the days leading up to Stephen's disappearance, we see Stephen going on these long multi-state travels and a blanket and pillow are found in Stephen's car parked there in the cul-de-sac in Henderson. Is this just a coincidence? Tina goes on to talk about the groceries Stephen had purchased right before he went missing. She says that Stephen had purchased the Walmart brand Great Value and the big sizes. To me, it does not make sense if he were planning to disappear that he would buy as much food as he did or that he would buy the largest size, especially on a tight budget. He bought juice, a two pound brick of cheese, and other perishables that were not opened. The peanut butter had been used once and it is a huge jar. It looks like he had bought about a month's worth of groceries. Yet again, we see here more evidence that Stephen was not planning to run off. Tina does actually bring up a good point here that if Stephen is planning on running off, why would you spend a lot of money when you have very little money? Money on all of these groceries that are the family size that will last you for a month or two. Tina concludes this post by saying that Jordan Zirkel, Stephen's roommate, would take Stephen's food from time to time. Here we see Tina planting seeds about Jordan Zirkel being a, a thief and taking advantage of Stephen. At some point, someone on the forums accused her and Brett of doing something to Stephen, and she replied, kind of hard for him to catch the rent up then. Brett was trying to work with Steve, and Steve had a little bit. He had been paying some part of the utilities to help keep keep them on and making promises and plans to catch up the rent. She further states that Brett has a big heart, too big sometimes. Brett keeps second guessing himself, thinking maybe he should have called the parents sooner or handled things differently. Brett has been the one talking to Stephen's parents and I know their grief tears him up. If Brett really did have a big heart, why hasn't he come forward with any information in the years since Stephen's disappearance? Why hasn't he come forward and talked to the investigators or made any statements about Stephen? Brett should be one of the most vocal persons on, on Stephen's case. Considering he was one of the last people to interact with Stephen in the week leading up to his disappearance, and he actually called Stephen on the day he disappeared and the day after. In another post, Tina continues to keep the focus on Jordan Zirkel, telling Stephen's cousin personal information about Jordan, including where he's originally from, his height, weight, tattoos, age range, vehicle type, where he is working, Jordan's use of marijuana, his non-payment of rent, and how the bishops were filing charges against Jordan. Yet again in this post by Tina, we see that she is more than willing to give up detailed information about Jordan while simultaneously suppressing important information about her and Brett. On another early post, Tina states, if Stephen was planning on another trip like Sacramento, he might have been thinking ahead and getting things in his car and shopping, thinking he would be busy up to Christmas. Okay, so here she mentions Sacramento, which I find strange. Could Tina be referring here to Stephen telling his old girlfriend's family in Ruby Valley that he was going to Sacramento to visit family? We know now that that Stephen saying this to that family in Ruby Valley was a lie. He'd made that up because the coaches don't have any family in, in Sacramento. I just find it odd that Tina would make this statement about Sacramento. She mentions Sacramento continuously in her posts, even stating in one post about Jordan Zirkel. I wonder if Jordan has any ties to Sacramento. Pot is legal there, isn't it, medically? So here again we see Tina planting seeds of suspicion about Jordan Zirkel. And I can't help but feel that these are statements to deflect away from Tina and Brett Bishop. And the reason I say this is because when the police raided Brett Bishop's garage, which is located behind Brett and Tina's house, they found a California medical marijuana license along with some marijuana. At that time in 2009, Sacramento was the mecca of medical marijuana. 
Could the truth really be that Tina was aware of Brett traveling to Sacramento on occasion to pick up medical marijuana for himself using this California medical marijuana license? And she was just projecting this information onto Stephen and Jordan? So Tina continues to trash and portray Stephen's roommate, Jordan Zirkel, in the worst way possible, stating, We have since heard rumors from an Orem police officer that Jordan was one of the biggest drug dealers in St. George. How the hell is an Orem police officer going to know anything about Jordan Zirkel, who lives four hours away in St. George? And why would the biggest drug dealer in St. George be renting out a room from Brett Bishop for $500 a month? And this biggest drug dealer in St. George happens to have a roommate, Stephen, who doesn't even drink coffee because it's a drug. The fact is that Brett Bishop lived in Orem, and Brett Bishop had just been busted for the possession of the Porsche and the pills and the weed and all these other things. But the people who are reading Tina's posts on web sleuths and slick deals, they don't know anything about this stuff. So she can assassinate Jordan Zirkel's character all day long and cast her and Brett in the best light possible, and nobody is going to be the wiser. Now let's take a closer look here at something she posts. Tina Bishop makes two posts on January 14, 2010. In the first post, Tina states the following. I keep wondering if Stephen had found something out about Jordan's illegal activities. Jordan is pretty young, mid-twenties I think, but what if he was some kind of drug dealer or something? So on the same day, January 14, 2010, that Tina makes this first post about Jordan, she makes this second post. We have since heard rumors from an Orem police officer that Jordan was one of the biggest drug dealers in St. George. Tina explains that both of these posts went up on January 14th at the same time because her posting privileges on web sleuths were on hold for a few days. So what Tina is saying is that in the span of two days, Jordan Zirkel went from maybe being a drug dealer or something to being the biggest drug dealer in St. George. That's a hell of a revelation that Tina has here in the span of a couple days about Jordan Zirkel. Tina concludes by saying that had they known Jordan was dealing drugs, he would have been evicted. Here again, we see the pot calling the kettle black. On another post, Tina continues to bash Jordan, saying, Jordan moved out in the middle of November. He didn't pay any rent for November. We were not able to get into Jordan's room because he changed the doorknobs and we never had the keys to get into his room. We didn't get into his room until the end of December. She states that when they did get into Jordan's room, that there was pot left behind in the room. She says, the cops came to look in Jordan's room and they said it was pot. No official testing or anything. So look, Brett Bishop at this point had been personally charged with possession of marijuana on multiple occasions over the span of many years. And don't forget, he was also busted with marijuana there in his garage alongside the stolen Porsche. So this portrayal by Tina that her and Brett were untainted and, you know, just complete newbies to marijuana and that they were indignant that Jordan had left pot in the room is just so laughable to me. I mean, she goes on to say that there were no signs of meth cooking. I mean, Tina really lays into Jordan on these posts. She goes as far as posting information about Jordan Zirkel's criminal charges from back in 2007. She puts links up of the Utah website where you can go and see Jordan Zirkel's criminal charges. And then she starts talking about the civil charges her and Brett had recently filed against Jordan. Yes, it is based on a civil judgment for non-payment of rent. He didn't show up to court dates at all. Brett talked to the detectives again and has the info he needs. When they find him, the detectives have questions for him about Steven. On one post, Tina pulls a scenario out of thin air that seems so precise and insightful that I can't help but wonder where this sudden level of expertise may have come from. Tina states, It seems like he knew someone there and was meeting them at noontime at the conclusion of a trip they may have hired him to take. Someone in the neighborhood has to know something, or someone close to that neighborhood has to know something. He was doing all that driving for a reason, and that was his last stop before he planned to go home. In one of her final posts on Web Sleuths, Tina says, I just don't think there are any new leads, and most old leads have led to a dead end. I say most because a detective working on the case called Brett a few days ago to ask more questions about Jordan, the old roommate. She continues, I feel the frustration of many who have been following Stephen's case. No matter how frustrated we may feel, I know his family is still devastated and more frustrated than ever. To us, 
it seems they are doing as much as they can and know how to do. So Tina at this point claims that there are no new leads and she lumps herself in with investigators and the Coacher family as also being frustrated due to the lack of leads. So if you were as frustrated as the investigators and the family about the lack of new leads, why don't you simply tell them what you know about Brett? Surely this information about Brett would be considered a new lead that they could take a look into. The last post Tina Bishop makes online is February 2012. After this post in 2012, Tina basically just walked away from the Stephen Kosher case. Months after claiming how much her and Brett cared about Stephen, and she's never heard from again. In total, I think Tina made around 25 to 30 posts on Web Sleuths, and she probably made double that on Slick Deals. And I'm not going to go into every single post, but you can go read them for yourself. I'll finish up this video with a post by Tina Bishop that she made on Web Sleuths. Tina states, I do not think Stephen is the type to knowingly participate in illegal activities. I do, however, think he, as many could be given the right circumstances, was duped into something illegal or a situation where he could be taken advantage of. I couldn't agree with you more, Tina. I think you're really on to something here. Thank you so much for checking out this update of the Stephen Kocher case. If you have any information on the disappearance of Stephen Kocher, please contact me, the Unfound Podcast, or the Henderson Police Department. I am offering a personal reward of $2,000 for any information that would help lead to the discovery of what happened to Stephen Kocher. Thanks again for watching, and please subscribe for future updates on my further investigations into the disappearance of Stephen Kocher.